that was the last um, qualification I ever got in life. I never went to university and I don't have any um, like higher learning qualification apart from like one or two courses I'll pick up. Hello everyone. Welcome to a session of data science and artificial intelligence in Africa. Today we have Abu Signoni, the founder of Sila Health. No, thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to start with um, asking like, uh, who are you and where are you from? All right. Uh, so my name is Babu Signoni and I was born in Bulawayo in Zimbabwe and I am the co-founder and CEO of Sila Health which is a global social enterprise that helps people everywhere access healthcare on any mobile device through harnessing machine learning or as it's commonly called um, artificial intelligence. And I use emerging technology to develop sustainable solutions for communities in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I founded Sida Health in 2019 after identifying an opportunity for artificial intelligence to fill some of the institutional voids created by poor healthcare systems in developing economies. Wow, that's very detailed and very interesting. Thank you. Um, so um, you say that your company is um, focuses on developing solutions using machine learning or artificial intelligence. So I'm just curious because people have like slightly different definitions. How would you define artificial intelligence? Yeah, I, I like to use, I guess, like the, the closest to objective um, definition of artificial intelligence, which is that it's the theory and development of computer systems able to perform tasks that normally require human intelligence. So this could be things like visual perception or speech recognition, decision making, and of course, as is commonly used, translation between languages. Okay, um, that's very interesting. So I was recently reading an article. Um, so now that you mentioned some of the tasks, I just got curious because I was reading an article that was talking about how artificial intelligence was mainly intended to perform tasks that humans can do, but most of it now is performing tasks that are a bit hard for humans to do yeah. um, in the same way that they do it. And the basic things that humans can do are proving to be difficult for um, um, artificial intelligence. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, the field has been growing pretty exponentially in the past couple of years. And I think it's specializing in some things that, um, you know, I wouldn't say humans can't do, but it definitely, uh, because of that over specialization can help increase the efficiency of certain processes or, you know, uh, in the case of self-driving cars, for example, make multiple decisions in a short amount of time than a human possibly could if they were, you know, uh, responsible for every cognitive need uh, while driving a car. So I think there are, you know, um, highs and lows with uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence, depending on how you like to call it. Um, but I think in future, as we work towards this point where artificial intelligence will um, surpass human intelligence, otherwise known as a singularity, um, we will see more instances of um, machine learning just completely, you know, dominating um, certain sectors, uh, or, you know, certain aspects of uh, multiple value chains that, uh, you know, human capital was an essential part of where now we can just completely replace that with something that is um, autonomous and um, artificial. All right, um, that's very detailed. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, but um, so in terms of the solutions that your company um, provides, um, so what exactly, um, maybe you can describe some of the uh, solutions that you provide and it's also um, what is your role in all of this? Are you involved um, practically like full-time or you are just managing um, things that are happening here? Yeah, I mean, I think before I get to Silla Health, it might be good for me to tell you um, or just paint a, a picture of my career leading up to this point and how, um, you know, I've been able to use my experience uh, to build this startup. 
Um, so I think one of the first things that I did with um, AI was to build uh, an AI football commentator um, that was used during the UEFA Champions League final in 2016 uh, by a, a client of an agency I was working at, which was Heineken. And um, I used part of this um, AI football commentator to build a prototype uh, for a machine learning model that can predict Africa's next refugee crisis um, using machine learning. And this is something that I uh, debuted to the world in uh, 2016 at a TEDx event. And um, in 2018, I started going into more creative uses of machine learning. Uh, one of the first things that I did was to use artificial intelligence to generate music, um, particularly GOM music, because of the similarities in the progress that the field had reached up until that point, and also the structure of music in that genre, in that it was often, um, you know, raw and, um, um, you know, it, very primal, and, you know, with AI not being as best suited to compose, like, more mainstream music, it seemed a likely pairing. Um, in 2018, I also, um, uh, through an innovation agency I run as well called Triple Black Agency, uh, built this uh, dance app called the Borsha Dance App, which uses computer vision to rate the Borsha Dance Move, uh, which is a uh, was popular um, dance move that was often accompanied, uh, or it was often an accompaniment to the GOM uh, music genre. Um, and then after creating the Vosha Dance app, um, I looked to repurpose the learning that we've taken from it in measuring movement over time. And we built um, a Parkinson's disease diagnosis app, uh, which we showcased at Oxford University um, in Silicon Valley at a, a Google uh, dev conference. and. Um, this was just basically looking at the same way we were able to rate dance moves and um, seeing how we could use that in a much more impactful way. Um, and yeah, um, I mean, all, all of this like ultimately led me to Scylla Health. Um, Scylla Health um, uses machine learning, in particular natural language processing, to increase access to healthcare by answering questions that people might have regarding their health on uh, platforms such as WhatsApp, SMS, and Facebook Messenger. And it uses uh, two uh, iterations of natural language processing to best understand um, user queries and then also um, give them the best results on the basis of their um, intent. And this was something that we rolled out initially in eight countries, but can be found in over 50 countries uh, globally and has um, you know, we've surpassed like over 1 million messages on the platform since launch. And um, yeah, um, so um, I run Scylla Health, um, started off as a technical founder and moved over to the business side. So I do oversee basically all aspects of the business. Uh, so everything from ops to tech to, to business development uh, falls on my shoulders. Oh, that's very interesting. So I also um, read like a couple of articles about that, that were describing some of the work that you've done. So I'm just curious, have you always been interested in music? Um, do you dance? Do you, I don't know. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> no, so, so my, my use of um, machine learning within like the creative space, particularly with music and dance was more um, to increase awareness of uh, the technology to an audience that, you know, previously would not ever imagine this like high end technology being used within the context of GOM, for example, which is music that you more or less find in townships and, and everything. Yes. So this was more, um, how can we take uh, like the latest iterations of uh, machine learning technology and use them in very African context to start conversations on African soil and, um, you know, basically try and inspire the next crop of creators or, or leaders um, on the possibilities of technology and how they apply uh, more often than not in an African context. Okay, that's very interesting. So um, in terms of 
um, your school, you said you were a technical founder. Um, so I was going to ask you what you studied and how you got into AI. Uh, but I also, I'm also interested in the skills and the tools that you use. So maybe we can start with what did you study, how you got into AI, and then we can move on to the skills. Yeah, so I studied um, my A-levels at Founders High School in Bulawayo in Zimbabwe. And that was the last um, qualification I ever got in life. I never went to university and I don't have any um, like higher learning qualification apart from like one or two courses I'll pick up just to become, you know, a better CEO. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm very self-developed. Um, I started off working as a graphic designer then I moved over to advertising when I um, moved to Cape Town in 2012 from Malawi. And then around 2013, 2014, I started to transition uh, over to the digital side of advertising uh, by picking up coding so that I could, you know, design websites and online experiences and also develop them as well. Just um, so I can, you know, guarantee the fidelity of the entire experience from what it's designed as versus what the experience should be like. And then also, you know, what ultimately the interface is when people use it. And um, yeah, from that point on, um, because I I basically taught myself, um, I realized there was no limit to what I could learn. So I just started just challenging myself to learn random things that, you know, if I'd gone to university, I would have been very intimidated by them because I wasn't instructed, uh, you know, on, on how to approach them. But because I'd learned everything I'd learned up until that point with without any external assistance, um, I just started challenging myself to do better, know better, um, you know, and I picked up, you know, Python as a language and um, that was, you know, instrumental in my foray into um, artificial intelligence or machine learning. And um, in terms of the tools that I use, um, a lot of the time, uh, I would say like design is the most important tool for me. So. Um, while I'm, of course, not a computer scientist or a data scientist, um, what my skill has been is um, understanding how to articulate tech to solve very human problems. So design thinking for me has been the most important um, aspect of my process in that, you know, no matter how complex tech might be, as long as it's well documented, I can find a way for it to be, to be applicable in, in situations that other people would struggle to find any, any overlap. Um, I work almost exclusively now with a lot of the uh, tools, uh, platforms and frameworks that Google um, has. So I work with TensorFlow, um, which is a, a machine learning framework um, which allows uh, for a variety of uh, models and transfer learning techniques um, um, across, I guess, like different models. And um, there are also some no code options like uh, Teachable Machine, which is also from Google, but of course there are some others um, out there that are also used to streamline my processes. Okay. That's, I, I'm very respectful of people who learn on their own. I mean, I study computer science, but um, I, I didn't really know that I was interested in um, data science machine learning up until I went for my master's and I took a course in data science. That's when I was like, I think I was wrong because I initially I used to think that I wanted to be a software developer and I went to do the master's just because my mom was um, like pushing me to get a master's. So I was fortunate enough to get a master's at an institute that was diverse in terms of um, the courses that we were doing. There were applied sciences and there were like different people from different backgrounds. So it kind of pushed me and um, helped me to see that this is what I actually like um, more than what I thought I liked before. So I'm always a bit jealous of people who find out that they like certain things on their own. Yeah, it's, you're really blessed. Um, so um, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm also curious, what skills do you expect for the people in your team, the people who are now working on the technical side? Yeah, I mean, so we don't, we don't have a lot of requirement for like human resource on the technical side. 
um, mainly because our product is very mature now. So we're more focused on, you know, the operational and business development side of things. Okay. And because we're growing at 80% uh, month over month. Um, like um, one of our most recent hires was a people officer, for example. So how do you start to think um, about, you know, properly scaling out as a company, you know, beyond acquiring customers and increasing revenue? You know, what are the things that you now need to start hedging in terms of, you know, growing your team and making sure that the, the tenets of your organization are, you know, successfully um, cascaded to everyone in reporting lines. Um, so we have um, very like specialized tracks um, around, you know, operations and business development, which also includes sales and also tech. And I have people heading um, each of these. Um, we have multiple verticals as well, who have their own uh, owners, but uh, the, the track that I just mentioned, um, they, they just cut across horizontally. So of course, you know, the, the people officer will work across uh, all of the revenue verticals as well as, you know, the, the ops teams as well. Um, so it's just a matter of figuring out who owns topics, who's the, basically the, the ultimate source of truth for anything either operational or relating to a specific vertical and then splitting responsibilities like that and um, making sure that, you know, everyone is motivated to do their best um, and of course, probably compensated for it. Okay, um, that's really good. I was really curious to know about that. Um, so now I am getting to the end of this. So the last question that I have is, um, do you have anything that you'd like to add or any advice for anyone who's interested in um, getting into AI? Yeah, I, mean, I know a lot of the time, you know, someone in my position would say you should just start or, you know, yes. just, <laughs> but I think the, the most effective advice would be to start with a goal. I think, you know, having something that you would like to work towards will definitely increase your uptake of new information and, you know, will give you an incentive to apply it. That's how I got into, into tech. So I didn't want to learn coding for the sake of it. I was very clear that I want to be able to, you know, code my own website so that they look the way that I designed them. And with, um, with things as I went along, I would literally think of something I would like to do and then learn all the things I need to learn in order to achieve that. And, um, you know, that goal oriented approach to, you know, self instruction has been really, really important uh, for me. And I think um, if, if someone's watching this and really, you know, either considering getting into tech, um, either, you know, horizontally shifting from uh, a current career path or just starting, you know, from the ground up, I think the easiest way to do that is to look at what you would like to achieve with what you might possibly learn. And that will definitely help you in being motivated to learn that and also being successful in applying it. Interesting, thank you. I, I normally like when people ask me um, any advice, I'm just like, if you can just work on a couple of projects and just put yourself out there, that's the advice that I usually give. But I feel like, um, for for someone who 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 learned on their own um what you're saying is really helpful because for me i learned the skills in school so now i knew what i could apply uh what i could use those skills for so i could just start working on a couple of projects as opposed to you where you think um what do i want to do and then you build from that so that's really yeah. useful um thank you so much for that um, so I, I've come to the end of the questions that I wanted to ask you. I don't know if there's anything that you feel like maybe I should have added this. Uh, no, no, no. I think I said, I said enough.